to stand? Let us stand. Um, today, we want to especially welcome back Vanessa and then Winston's family in our midst, and also some newcomers, I can see. So, um, shall we just greet one another to begin with and walk around and bless each other? <laughs> Okay, let us start our service with a prayer. Let us turn our focus to our Lord. Let's pray. Great God of redemption, we've come into your presence, Lord. Father, we would thank you that we can have the gift of waking up to a new day to worship you, to stand in your presence. <coughs> to meet with you as a family, and to hear from you, Lord. Father, we want to worship you in spirit and in truth, for you are spirit. Father, open our hearts. Do the work, Lord. Lord, we have come to sing your goodness, your mighty power, your wisdom, proclaiming what you've done in our lives. Father, we want to be amazed and continue to be amazed the gift of love that you've given us in Christ Jesus. Shine in our hearts, Lord. Shine in our hearts as we worship. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh 
thank you for your faithfulness. We want to thank you for who you are. We do not deserve your love, your grace, your faithfulness, but Lord, you have given them all to us. Father, we may be weak, but your spirit is strong in us. As we worship, Lord, we do not worship with our strength. As we go through our life on earth, we do not go through with our own strength. But Lord, that you are the only person who can satisfy our deepest need. We want to thank you and sing that Christ, Lord, you are enough for us.
this church be the center of this church Lord be the center of all we do in this church we thank you that you are the Lord of us the Lord of this church we thank you in Jesus name Amen please be seated we thank God for bringing us here. We thank God for a family that is in Christ. We thank God for a church that holds up his name, that speaks about the hope that's found in Jesus Christ, and that those who trust in him will have the right to become children of God. And today as we gather together, we are committed to him. And today, when we are gathered together, first of all, we want to examine ourselves. First of all, to clear the, clear the page again. So let's pray together. Father, we thank you today that we gather here. Father, today we want to ask your Holy Spirit to examine our lives. Holy Spirit, show us where there are ways that displease you whether it's in our speech, whether it's in our thought, whether it's in our attitude, whether it's in what we do. Lord, today we no longer want to hide those things from you. Today we want to confess it to you. And Lord, we know that your word says that those who come to you, you will not cast out. And that if we confess our sin, you are faithful and just. And we will forgive all our sins. And so, Father, we know that we can come before you again and again to confess our sin. And that we know that your blood, Jesus Christ, will wash us whiter than snow. Our sin separate us from you, Father. We want to get rid of it so that we can come right before you. And that, Father, our relationship with you will be restored and that we can hear you and we will continue walking with you. And thank you for this hope that is found in you. Thank you for this um, unchanging truth that is found in you. So we thank you, we praise you. And Lord, as you forgive us, Father, we are restored to you. And that, Father, we want to give praise to you. Father, now as we take up uh, an offering, Father, a symbol of how you love us, provide for us, and that we want to give to you in obedience to you in our tithes and offering as a, as a response to building your kingdom. Father, today, Will you teach us how to give cheerfully? Will you give us to give in faith? And will you teach us how to give generously for your kingdom's sake? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we're going to have a time of offering now. And do this with gladness in your heart.
Thank you that not only do you provide for all that we need in our material needs. Father, house to live in, clothing that we wear, work that uh, prosper us. Father, you provide for us, friends and family, but more than that. Lord, you promise to change us. You promise to transform our lives. You promise that, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will tell us what pleases you. You promise that you will lead us in your will, which is good and pleasing. Thank you, Lord, that you continue to invest in our lives. Thank you that you continue to work in our lives, continue to draw near to us, continue to want to work in us so that we walk in the path that you have laid, us, laid out for us. Father, today we pray that as we respond to you in tithes and offering. That, Father, it is a representation that our lives belong to you completely and wholly. And that, Lord, we want to continue to learn from you, continue to be transformed by you, continue to become your children, continue to be ambassadors for you in every single way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning. I'm so glad you're here. It's good to worship together as a family of God. And God is the one who is leading us step by step. And sometimes He surprises us um, in, in many ways. And today, if you are here, we, what, do, what do I mean today you're here? If you are, I want you to come and enjoy the, the word from God. But I also want you to come and have fellowship later on uh, for tea and coffee. Uh, welcome back, Ken and Carmen. I hope you had a wonderful holiday. Next item. Um, the stable bee is nearly complete. No, it's actually complete. It's fit for worship. But we want to just have different bits that is uh, nearly to be done. We're going to move on to the sports hall. 
We want to continue the fundraising efforts, and then once it's completed, we can uh, take this uh, slide off. But we had a wonderful service uh, last week. I also want to let you know that because God is blessing us with so many people coming to church, and every one of us drive a car, and that um, there is some traffic congestion. But Pastor Chow has, is leading a team that will look after the traffic. And whenever any of the warden tells you to move, please listen to them because they have been given authority by Pastor Chow and further that authority by God. So you want to move, okay? So in order to know um, if you're double parking, what we want to do is collect all the car registration number and who, who is it and your mobile number so that we can tap you on the shoulder for you to move uh, discreetly. And so there will also be a sign. It won't apply so much for our service, but later service that if the car park is full, there'll be a car park full sign outside. And then perhaps you can look for car park along the, along, not along Eska Road, but along the other side. Uh, okay, and also to the um, uh, sports centre. Okay, so you're very welcome, and I'm going to pass the time over now to Pastor Chow for God's word to us. You notice that I brought this today with me. <coughs> You know, this is very trendy. Everybody bring one of these, you know, to drink when you're on the driving in the car or whatever. And, you know, I'm, I, I'm not trying to advertise, but this is a very good one. Because uh, I've been looking for a good one for a long time. You know. you know, the purpose of these things is to, you know, keep your drink warm. Right? But uh, I've gone through so many of them. Some of them really... 20 minutes, 15 minutes, and the drink will begin to cool down, to, to get cold. Okay? This one's pretty good. This one will keep hot. You know, it still burn your mouth after two, three hours. Okay? So this is a good one. Now, this is, a, this is a nature of physics. Isn't that right? When you have a hot drink, it will cool down naturally. The most you can do is to find something good to keep it warm. You need to keep it warm. But no matter how good this is, naturally it will begin to go lukewarm, begin to go cool. The only way to keep something really, really hot all the time is to keep boiling it. Okay? So, I mean, we, 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 we all know, yesterday I was trying to boil some noodles, okay? To, to, have, to have for dinner, and uh, I put the noodles in the pot, put the pot on the ring, and went and wait, you know, did something else to wait, and uh, 20 minutes later, came back, and the noodle was not boiled, because I forgot to turn the gas on. Okay? You know that you have gas in the house, you know that you have natural gas, or electric, or whatever, but do you know you have it? You pay for it, but do you know how to turn it on? Do you remember to turn it on? You see, the message that I want to share with you this morning is about keeping your fire for God. It's about not being lukewarm. And that's the picture that I gave you just now. By ourselves, naturally, our fire will cool. The most we will try to do is to come to church, go to fellowship, right? get people to try to keep us hot, keep us warm. But no matter how good that keeper is, we will slowly, still, slowly, gradually, you know, that may be four hours, but six hours later, eight hours later, it will be cool again. The only way to keep ourselves hot and on fire for God is to have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit that lights up the fire in us. Now, the question is, just like me trying to cook my noodle, we all, as Christians, have the Holy Spirit. We all have 
gas and fuel piped into our lives, just like natural gas into your house. But do we turn it on? Do we know how to turn it on? Because unless we allow the Holy Spirit to fire us up all the time and consistently, our spirit is going to get cold. And I want to share with you today a character from the Bible, and we will learn from him today how not to cool down, how lukewarmness in our heart will eventually become a heart that rebels against God. And then we'll look at somebody else in the Bible this morning, and we will look at how the Holy Spirit in his life kept him on fire and the result of him being on fire for God. So let's look at the first character. Now, this is a quiz for you. I want to see how many people know where to find the character, where to find in the Bible, the character a Messiah. M. Messiah. M. Messiah. Have you even heard of the person? No? Anyone? Ken doesn't count. Anyone? Ken knows. Ken knows everything about the Bible. So anyone apart from Ken, you know where to find M. Messiah, you raise your hand, and I'll buy you a spice bag. No one? Oh, no cheating, Mimi. No cheating. No cheating. Okay? I'll raise the price. Anyone? No, don't, don't check on your phone. I'll raise the price from a spice pack to a siung afan, roast duck rice. Still no? Okay, so the, the rice is for me, okay? Turn to me, turn with me to the book 2 Chronicles chapter 25. Amaziah, king of Judah. A Messiah is an obscure, quite obscure character. Only one chapter. And, and, and mention him in this chapter and then we don't, we don't see him ever again. Now, let me give you some background. Okay? He was the king of Judah about 200 years after King David was king. Okay, so 200 years after King David. Now, you know that King David's son... King Solomon, and you know what happened after King Solomon? Israel, the kingdom of God, was broken into two, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. Right? Now, this is where the confusion begins for a lot of us. Right? Because the northern kingdom, okay, the, the, let me just make sure I get it right. Okay? The kingdom is divided into north and south, and uh, the southern, let's start with the southern kingdom. The southern kingdom has everything that we associate with the people of God. Okay. We had the temple there. Okay. We had Jerusalem there. And we also have all the kings in the southern kingdom who were descendants of David. But the southern kingdom was called Judah. Okay. The northern kingdom had none of those things that we associate with God's people. No Jerusalem, no temple, and, 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 and the kings were not descendants of David, but they were called Israel. Okay, so this is where the confusion is. So Judah, that's why in the Bible, you hear the word, Jesus was the lion of Judah. Okay. Even though we say Israel was the people of God. So that's the only confusion that you need to clear in your head. So we're talking about Judah here, the southern kingdom. And here we read that, let's, let's just read the story. And Messiah the 20, was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 29 years. This is his mother's name, and she was from Jerusalem, and he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, but not wholeheartedly. Now, this is the key that I want to point you towards in this passage. This is a king who tried to do what was right, but not wholeheartedly. And I believe that represents a lot of us here today, this morning. 
we're here, at least we're here, we try to do the right thing. We try to be good. We go to church. Okay. We try not to steal. We try not to lie. We try not to do bad things. We try to do what is right in the name of God, in, in the sight of God. But, unfortunately, many of us, just like a Messiah, we do not do so wholeheartedly. And in verse 3, he says, After the kingdom was firm in its control, he executed the officials who had murdered his father, the king, yet he did not put their sons to death, but acted in accordance with what is written in the law, in the book of Moses, where the Lord commanded, Father shall not put to death for the children, nor children put to death for their father. Each is to die for their own sin. This is, this, is, this is the first step of being cold. First step of downfall. The first step being lukewarm. Being not wholehearted. Okay. Now, he tried to do the right thing. You see here, he, followed, he didn't follow tradition. If you look at history, he had every reason to murder all his opposition. Because his father, his grandfather, if you look at history, his father, his grandfather, his great-grandfather were all assassinated by enemies. So when he became king, it was very logical for him to kill everybody, all the entire family of his, of his opposition. But he wanted to obey God's law. He went back to the book of Moses and he says that, no, Moses says, the law says, we shall not punish people on, that, that, that have not sinned. The father sin, we punish the father. The children sin, we punish the children. So we don't kill the children for the sin of the father. So he at least tried to do, this is the first step, he at least tried to do the right thing, but his heart was lukewarm. So no matter where you are at the moment, that you are at the right position with God, if your heart is not wholehearted, you're in danger. You're pointing yourself in the wrong direction, a risk, risky direction. Because as we read, we begin to see what happens. Verse 5, he says, A Messiah called the people of Judah together and assigned them according to their families to commanders of thousands and commanders of hundreds for all Judah and Benjamin. He then mustered these 20 year olds or more and found that there were 300,000 men ready for military service able to handle the spear and shield. Now look at verse 6. It said, He also hired a hundred thousand fighting men from Israel for a hundred talents of silver. So you see the picture. He became king. He wanted to do the right thing, but he wasn't wholehearted. And now he's at war. He's at war with enemies of God's people, the Edomites. And now... What do we read in verse 6? He recruited 100,000 fighters from the northern kingdom, from the kingdom that split away from, 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 from Judah. Verse 7, it says, A man of God came to him and said, O king, these troops from Israel must not march with you, for the Lord is not with Israel, nor with any of the people of Ephraim. Even if you go and fight courageously in battle, God will overthrow you before the enemy, for God has the power to help or to overthrow. You see the story here. Okay. The man of God came and warned the king. He says, look, Israel, the northern kingdom, have departed from God's way. God not pleased with them. You recruited 100,000 people from them. You're not supposed to do that. You're not supposed to have an alliance with people that are opposing God. And, the peop and, and this man of God reminded King and Messiah, he says, God has the power to help or to overthrow. So the teaching there was that you try to do the right thing, you keep on doing the right thing. Because you do the right thing, God will make you successful. Recruiting from Israel, recruiting from the northern kingdom, the man of God says, it's the wrong thing to do. And if we look at the story again, verse 9, Amasiah still continued to try to do the right thing. He says, 
He asked the man of God, but, ah, you see what's happening here, verse 9. He says, what about the hundred talents I paid for these Israeli troops, these Israelite troops? The man of God replied, the Lord can give you much more than that. So now we see the second step. And this is a very subtle step. This is the step of distraction. When your heart is not fully on God, when you are lukewarm, you are easily distracted. Your mind is not fully on God. Your mind gets distracted by other things. Here we see Amaziah. Amaziah, he wanted to do the right thing. He wasn't wholehearted. Now look what he's concerned with. He's concerned with, what about the money I paid? Okay, okay, it's a lot of money. But it shows us that his mind is now on things of the world. He recruited, first of all, he made a mistake. He recruited people that he shouldn't have recruited. He had an alliance with people that opposed God, that, that God was not pleased. And now he's concerned with the money, the things of this world. And the man of God had to remind him, look, why are you concerned about this? Why are you distracted? God can give you a lot more back. Do you not trust God? So, you're not wholehearted. The next step, because you're not wholehearted, you get distracted. You get distracted by things of this world. You get distracted by things that are not of God. Let's see what happened to Amaziah. Amaziah, in verse 10, still tried to do the right thing. Of course, he still tried to do the right thing, but he's on a slippery slide now. So Amaziah dismissed the troop who had come to him from Ephraim and sent them home. This is from the northern kingdom. All the mercenary, he sent them home. And they were furious with Judah and left for home in a great rage. Verse 11, Then Amaziah then marshaled his strength and led his army to the valley of Salt, where he killed 10,000 men of Sir. The army of Judah also captured 10,000 men alive and he slaughtered them all. Verse 13, Meanwhile, the troops that Amaziah had sent back had not allowed to take place in the war, raided Judean towns from Samaria to Beth Horon, and they killed 3,000 people and carried off great quantity of plunder. Now, why was that? What's happening here? Why was it that God allowed these people that Amaziah had sent back, the enemies of God, to, to then go and have some sort of victory to plunder in revenge. Because you see in verse 14, you see that it's because when Amaziah returned from slaughtering the Edomites, he brought back the gods of the people of Sir. Not only did he bring them back, bringing them back, bringing the gods back was, worse, was bad enough. He set them up as his own gods, bowed down to them and burned sacrifice to them. And the anger of the Lord burned against Amaziah, and he sent a prophet to him who said, Why do you consult, the people, consult this people's God, which could not save their own people from your hand? Do you see that? This is amazing. Amaziah had just won an amazing battle, having sent back the mercenaries that are not from God, and he won an amazing battle. He was on the win. This is like somebody, you, you, were you watching athletics recently? The Commonwealth Games, the, all the races, it's, it's like you're racing and you are up in the front. You are winning. And then what happened? It's as if you were winning and suddenly you stop, even though you're in front, and you turn around and you ran the opposite way. This is what happened to Amaziah. Do you see the downfall of this man? Because he wasn't full Full-hearted, he wasn't wholehearted for God. He opened his life to distraction. And when life, when you are distracted, you yield to temptation. Because you're not wholehearted, you yield to temptation. Just like the tea in the pot that is not warm. The pot is not good. You're not wholehearted. You get colder and colder and colder. Now, you see this man who tried to do things right at the beginning, but not wholeheartedly. This is not as if he didn't try. He tried. 
but not wholeheartedly, got distracted by the things of this world, and eventually yielded to the temptation from the things around him. And now you see the complete downfall. When the prophet sent by the angry God to ask him, why did you, and, and it makes sense, why did you consult with these gods who couldn't save the people you defeated? What stupidity is there? But you know, when you are moving away from God, you are blinded. You're blinded to things that don't make sense. You need God to wake you up. You need God to open your eyes. You need God to open your eyes and see how stupid the decision was. But did Amaziah wake up? Amaziah didn't wake up. Verse 16, while he was still speaking, the king said to him, this is while the prophet was still speaking, the king said to him, have we appointed you an advisor to the king? Stop. Why be struck down? Do you see how this person, King Amaziah, has fallen from trying to do the right thing? And all because he didn't do so wholehearted. All because he was lukewarm. As a result of being lukewarm, he became distracted. With the distraction, he yielded to temptation. And now temptation got hold of him and now, he even refused God. He turned God's prophet away. God's prophets come to you and says, look, why are you doing this? Open your eyes. Turn away. And what do you say to the prophet of God? What do you say to your advisor and your counsel and your mentor? Say, don't speak to me anymore. I don't want to hear you anymore. And if it's the king, he says, you want to be beaten? It's even threatened the person who gave him advice. And as you read the rest of the story, which you go back and read for yourself, you will see that from that moment onwards, the story of Amaziah goes from worse to worse to worse to worse. From that moment onwards, you see that he went from one disaster to another disaster. He went and fought a war and he lost. And he got captured, and he became a slave. And then 10 years later, when the opposing king died, he got sent back to his own ruined city. And then the people in his own ruined city rejected him, chased him up, and murdered him, and killed him. The downfall of this king and Messiah. Who started right? Who started wanting to do the right thing? The Bible says that he did the right things in the eyes of God. There's a warning to all of us here. We're all sitting here. We're all trying to do the right thing. And that's a message today from Amaziah. Just like a pot of tea. You started off hot. You are right. You are right. But will you be right? If you are not wholehearted, if you don't keep the fire burning, and you get distracted, and you yield to temptation, and you end up rejecting God. A downward slope, from hot to lukewarm, and if you don't do something about it, from lukewarm to become cool, from cool to become cold, from cold to become rejecting God. Let's contrast it, okay? I don't want to just deliver a sermon of bad illustrations. Let's look at an encouraged illustration. Let's turn to the New Testament and look at the book of Luke. A person called Simeon. Okay. Sure you've heard of this guy, this old man. Simeon was the person in the temple when Mary and Joseph took the baby Jesus for dedication, for infant dedication. And you read that in Luke chapter 2. Verses 25 onwards. And say, now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon, who was righteous and devout. And he was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. That was a picture I gave you. The difference between Amaziah and Simeon 
is that Simeon had the Holy Spirit on the boil. The fire was burning. This pot of water is never going to get cold because it's on the top, being burned, being boiled. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. Verse 26, and it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was telling him things, relating to him, that he would not die before he see the Lord Christ. And then verse 27, moved by the Spirit. Again, you see, his life was controlled and moved by the Holy Spirit. He went into the temple court at the same time, at the exact time that Jesus appeared as an infant, taken there by his parents. He was sharp. The Spirit was there guiding him, doing all these things. First, the Spirit told him, look, you're not going to die, you're going to see the glory of God. But he has to be sharp. He has to keep listening to the Spirit right at this right time. For that very morning, he woke up and the Spirit said to him, today is the day, go to the temple. And he went to the temple. And there, he saw the baby, Jesus. He was at the temple, he went into the temple court when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law requires. Simeon took him in his arm and praised God and said, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all people, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for the glory to your people Israel. Simeon and Amaziah both started right. The Bible says King Amaziah did right in the eyes of God. Here we say Simeon was a righteous and devout person. But this is where the two persons' experience became different. One, King Amaziah, not wholehearted. Two, Simeon, he was filled with the Holy Spirit, his life led and controlled, obeying the Holy Spirit. Simeon was sincere, earnest, is a spiritual man who loved the Lord with all his heart, with all his soul, with all his strength, and with all his mind. That's what the Bible says. Because for his whole life, he's 80 years old. His whole life, he waited, he longed for God's glory to be shown. And if you look at the description there, in the whole passage, there just short few verses, the number of times the Holy Spirit was mentioned, that the Holy Spirit was upon him, verse 26, that it was revealed by the Holy Spirit, verse 27, uh, 26. And verse 27, so 25, 26, 27, every verse talks about the Holy Spirit, the impact of the Holy Spirit, the fire on the boil, keeping him going, People who are filled with the Holy Spirit are the ones that knows what to do because God is there. It's God's Spirit who is able because that is God's power and encouraged because he has God's presence. So he was kept on fire. And you see the consequence of that. When he saw the glory of God, he says, God, I have seen your glory. Now you can dismiss me in peace. What does that mean? I can now die. You can now take my life. Do we have that attitude? Whether we're young or old, that my only, my only purpose in life is to want to see the glory of God. It's to want to see God's glory. I want to see God's glory here. I want to see God's glory in people's lives. I want to see God's glory in this city. There's nothing else in my life that is worth living for. This is what Simeon is saying. Now I've seen your glory, God. That's it. Take me home. There's nothing more I want. There's nothing more I desire. Or rather, we were not like that. We said, oh no, Lord, I want to see glory, but I also want this. I want to be rich. I want to be powerful. I want to have a beautiful wife, a handsome husband. I want to have nice kids, well-behaved. I want to have all sorts of things in this world. 
Can we say, we just want the glory of God? The, the pure heart, that is the purest form of our heart. There's nothing else that I desire. Now, that's a wonderful dream. But the message today is simply that we cannot get to that dream if we start with a lukewarm heart. If we don't keep our heart boiling for God, if we don't yield our life to God's Holy Spirit and let Him guide us, let Him empower us, our fire will go out very cold. And you end up like Amaziah, rejecting God, wanting the things of this world, and end up having nothing. Because nothing in this world matters. Nothing in this world we can carry it away when we die. Do you desire a pure heart? Do you desire the purest form of heart where you are like Simeon? Not distracted by the things of the world like King Amaziah. Not chasing after things that you know don't make sense. How many times have you heard preacher says to you, the thing of this world, why are we chasing after them? Okay, there are some things we need. We need clothes. We need warmth. We need food. So we need to work. We need to have an income. We need to have companionship. Those things we do need. But like the prophet said to King of Messiah, read that passage again. God will provide for you. God will provide for you much more than you need. King of Messiah is worried about, well, well, I paid all this money for this mercenary, what do I do? The man of God says, God will provide. And we know it makes sense. Just like the prophet said to King of Messiah, come on, wake up. Why are you worshipping the gods of the people that can't even, you can't even win over you? You defeated them. You defeated them, and yet you're worshipping their god. How stupid can you be? Sometimes we know things make sense, but we refuse to listen to it. We, we fight against it, and we have this bully tactic. When people say things that make sense to us, our bully tactic is, stop, I don't want to listen anymore. Go away. You want me to beat you up? That's what King Amasa said. That is all because we started with a heart that is not fully following God. A lukewarm heart. Let us be like Simeon, not like King Messiah. Let us have this pure heart, this heart that longs for God. This heart that only has God as our desire. This heart that says, God, once I have seen your glory, you can take me home. There's nothing more in this world that, that I desire. And then people say that to me. I share with you my testimony. Somebody challenged me one time. Says, you're very selfish. They say, all you want to see is God's glory, and then when you see God's glory, you want to leave. What about the people you love? You're going to leave them all behind. I tell them, no. I'm quite happy because my See, more, my wife is a Christian. I'll see her up there. My two daughters are Christians. I'll see them up there. The people that I love, they're all Christians. That's why it's important to convert, to make sure that all the people you love become Christians. Right? So that they can all go with you and not leave behind on this earth. Because really, we all go up there and we leave this place behind. That's a pure heart. Do you have that pure heart? Let's sing. Let's pray. Let us not be like Amaziah. Let's remember that. Let us not be like Amaziah. Let us not try to do the right thing, but half-heartedly. Today, we need to make a decision to be full-hearted, whole-hearted. If you want to be whole-hearted, you make a decision now. You need to be whole-hearted. Make that decision now. Because if you don't make, this, make that decision, you're going to be like my pot of tea. How long can you stay hot? Yeah, how long can you stay hot? You have a good church, you have good fellowship, you will stay hot for a, a little longer. 
You have a poor thermal fast and your tea will go cold quicker. If you don't have the support, you go cold quick. You get good support. You go hot a little bit longer, but still, eventually you're going to go cold. But a heart that is pure, the heart that is maintained by the Spirit, a heart that is only focusing on God, that heart is always on fire. That heart doesn't need a thermal flask. That heart is hot for God. And that heart desire to live only to see the glory of God. Pure That's what I long for A heart that follows heart After thee A pure Time for us to respond as we sing this song again. A usual way of responding with me. When you're touched by God and you want to respond as we sing, you stand. You stand before God and say, God, I respond. Don't just stand because other people are standing. Be genuine and true. You're not ready yet. Be honest with God. But if you're ready, this is the time. As we sing again, stand before God and says, yes, God, take away my lukewarmness, take away my coolness, fire me up, for I desire a pure heart.
you, Lord, for hearing our prayers and our heart's desire as we stand before you, as we sing our hearts to you. Come and renew us. Ignite the spirit that is in each one of our lives. Let the spirit begin to burn and warm up that which is cold and keep that as hot, continuously hot. For we know that apart from you, there is nothing meaningful in our lives. Apart from your glory, there is nothing in this life that we need. So hear our prayer. Anoint and fire us up as we respond to you. And may we, may we and our heart be pleasing unto you. The rest of those of you who are still sitting, please stand also now. Let's all stand and receive the blessings of God. As we leave here, let the Spirit guide us. Let the Spirit empower us. And let the Spirit bless us. Grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of our Father God and the fellowship indeed of the Holy Spirit will be with each one of us to stay at home. Go with a pure heart in the love of God. Amen.